Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, good. Nicely mic'd up. That's, that's a good start. So, uh, I, um, I've only got 25 minutes, so I won't be able to tell you all about IoT, which I could talk about all afternoon, and it's a fascinating topic. But I'd like to start by uh, introducing, say, what are we talking about with the IoT? What is it? Because I've been in building automation, as, as has just been said, for some uh, quite a number of years, uh, but the We've been doing connected sensing devices to the internet for quite a long time. But now the IoT has suddenly come along in the last two years and it's a real buzzword and everyone's talking about it. Uh, so what actually is new? What is different about the IoT? Well, actually the IoT as a term was first coined a long time ago, back in 1999. Uh, and uh, that, there's the definition. I don't need to read it for you. But the it's not actually very new, but it's really become fashionable in the last few years, and for good reason, because it's actually what I would call an umbrella term. So it's actually a number of different trends coming together, converging, uh, to create a new set of opportunities. And we've, we've lived with the, the growth of the internet and connecting people via computers and now through smartphones and so on to one another with social media and all the rest of it. And the IoT is the connection of things together, devices, uh, and, and that's all about networking. So it's a combination of a lot of things, but particularly connecting devices uh, through the internet. The other, one of the trends that is relevant here to this conference is that we're, you're talking about facilities management or more broadly what we could call operational technologies, things that help us operate the, w the way we do business. And then on the other side, the information technologies, uh, the IT, as we commonly call it. And this, the intersection of this is, is another way of looking at what the IoT is. The challenge is that interoperation. How do you make all these different worlds talk to each other? Because operational technologies have historically been quite separate and siloed and not at all connected to the IT and the computer world. Uh, and now these two things are crashing together. Uh, and, and how does it all work? And that's the business that we're in, uh, my, my company, Distech, is in. But IoT is not just about monitoring. It's not just about collecting data. Uh, it's also about control. Uh, and the, this is expanding there. And again, I won't read it to you because I'm sure you can read that. But it's about the, the way in which we manage the spaces we, we occupy, be it buildings, data centers, factories, smart cities. They all need to be managed and controlled. Uh, and so there's two dimensions. There's getting data, and then there's what you do with it. And that leads us to have smarter management. And we talk now about smart buildings. Uh, well, at the moment, a lot of buildings aren't very smart, to be honest. Uh, but they can be a lot smarter. The technology is arriving. Some of it's here already. And as someone, one of the earlier speakers said, it's not evenly distributed. You know, some buildings are great exemplars of what is possible, and others are way behind the curve. So the IoT is encompassing a number of different things. First of all, big data. I don't know if you've heard of that piece of jargon, but that is just saying all of the data, lots and lots of data is being collected, uh, especially now in the cloud, uh, and stored in huge quantities. Um, uh, and th that is a, a whole topic in itself. And then, because we've got so much data, it's becoming quite impossible for people to deal with that at a human level. So we have now analytics, which enable computer programs to analyze that data and to, to go through huge amounts of it and pick out the useful and interesting things, the exceptions uh, and the, the salient information from that huge sea of data. And then we've got what we call edge devices. You've got very small end devices. And this is perhaps, I'll show you uh, just briefly, an example of how, how this could go. So here we have three edge devices at the really small level, little tiles. This is a push button. This is a temperature sensor. And this is a, a proximity sensor, something you could put on, your, on a door to say whether it was open or not, or on a chair to say if someone was sitting in it. And they're battery powered, and they can talk to the cloud via a, an access point. Uh, so these can provide data from your building. 
I mean, but this is uh, with a battery life of about 10 years, I'm told, but this is a, a new development, so who knows. Um, but this is an edge device at the ultimate, but most edge devices are rather larger than this, but they're still sitting around the building, they're, they're sensors, they're actuators, they're, they're devices that are doing something in the building. And then a lot of them, as I've just indicated with this, it's wireless. You don't want to have wire. If you're dealing with existing building portfolios, then having to run wires everywhere is a nightmare, and it's just not cost-effective either. So actually having wireless technology is revolutionizing things. Now, wireless has been around for a long time, but what's changing is that it's getting cheaper, uh, and it's getting more reliable, although that's still sometimes an issue, uh, and, and it's getting um, much more robust and, and the standards, as we'll talk about, beginning to emerge too. And then we've got cloud services, I already mentioned, as a way of hosting the data. So lots of different trends coming together to uh, facilitate what we now call the Internet of Things, the, the, this huge explosion of connected devices. Now, talking about the big data a little bit more, it's really like a tsunami of data. It's just overwhelming. Uh, lots of it. So uh, there, there are, there's the real-time data in the buildings, the temperatures, the meter data, the energy data, the, uh, the light levels, and so on. And then you've also got all your static data, what we more static data, which is your HR records and your, um, the access data from who's in the building that day, uh, all sorts of records and so on that organizations keep. And somehow we need to merge these all together uh, in order to get useful uh, smarter building. Because it's quite hard to find that information, that's why we need the analytics uh, to find the needle in the haystack. And this automation of analysis, instead of people looking at graphs and pouring through spreadsheets and actually having computer programming doing, doing it for us, is, is a very big change. And the good thing about that is it works 24-7. Computer programs don't get tired. Uh, the, they can see things that human, human operators can't spot, patterns and trends. Uh, and uh, obviously, skilled people are at a premium and cost a lot of money. So a computer program has the advantage that it can do that uh, at less cost. And then from all that sea of data, you can get something that's actionable that can help you improve the way you work. So what data are we talking about from the building point of view? And I, bear in mind, I, I work for a building automation company, so I'm looking at the real-time data side of things rather than all that other organizational data that you have as well, which is equally valuable to you if you can mine it, uh, but uh, it is not the part I, I'm fam so familiar with. Uh, now, HVAC, that, for those who aren't into the jargon, that means heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Uh, the lighting then as well, uh, blind, shading, refrigeration, alt metering, CCTV lifts, all sorts of things. And that's just an ordinary building, you know, so then specialized buildings have even more than that. So there's lots of different parts of data. Now, historically, that was all standalone uh, it, devices doing their thing. To, you know, a light switch is a standalone thing. It just turns the lights on and off. Well, that's all changing. Uh, then they were all networked together locally on site. Uh, and, and now, uh, well, uh, they're going to the cloud more. But there are multiple silos of, of data or islands of intelligence. They weren't all joined up. So what's happening in, in the technology now is how do you join it all up? I think most of the data is going to be in the cloud going forward um, because it, then there's not the headache of, of it being hacked locally and, and local security things. Uh, also because it's cost effective to do it that way. And, and the likes of Amazon and Google and so on are, are, and Microsoft are creating huge cloud services to provide for that. Uh, yeah, so these are just some of the providers. Um, then there's also a move towards software as a service, and there are many providers of that as well. I just, I'm just mentioning one, Atrius, which is launched by our parent company, and they're focused on lighting control in North America. So not so relevant over here at the moment, although Atrius services will be coming to Europe soon. But there, 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 there's a, the idea that your application, your analytics, the service that's required to deal with the data is also on the cloud. So you don't have to have it locally. You don't have to buy a copy anymore. You just pay for it per month or, or per use. 
So the evolution of this, uh, just a few I thought this was quite helpful uh, as a way of thinking about it. You've got a, a brain in your, in your building. Uh, it's been a very small brain historically. Maybe your buildings still do have a very small brain and they give you some sort of management of the building. And, and BMSs used to be, uh, could be regarded in that way. And then as time's gone on, we've developed more capability in the system on site. So the brain has got bigger and it can look at more things and it can collect more data. But in the future, the, the build, and this is beginning to happen with already, uh, we'll have buildings that are more cognitive, is one way of describing it, in that they're actually smart in their own right. They can actually make decisions themselves about how to optimize what's going on instead of having to have a human being saying what's going on. Obviously, you know, humans, we will set the parameters and set the, the rules, if you like, but that they, the, the, the building can genuinely become smart and learn how to be the best building it can be for what you need it to do. Now, to achieve all that, you, I said earlier that the interoperation of information technology and operation technology and even bringing all the different facility systems together is a real challenge. So we have to talk about integration. Uh, so, in my world, the, we have o what are called open protocols. A protocol is like a computer language uh, or standard way of communicating. So, it's, it's the computer equivalent of talking French or English or German. Um, and there are more open standards now in communicating between systems than there were. So, if we roll the clock back 10 years, most systems were proprietary. Uh, each manufacturer had their own protocol and that meant that you could only buy stuff from the same manufacturer. Of course, the manufacturer thought that was a great advantage because that meant if you'd already got their system, you had to go back to them for any extras. But of course, to end users, that's not helpful because that means you're tied in to one provider and you want to have choice. So that's why open standards emerged. So a way of giving end users demanding that they want to have some choice. And that's happened to varying degrees in the different silos within facilities management. So it's much more stronger on HVAC uh, and lighting. Uh, there are some good standards. But in, if you go into the security industry, it's still very proprietary, uh, although they do have some support for open standards. So these are some of the protocols that are used in open standards. Wow. Well, there's a, not a short list. Uh, those, that's, and that is not even comprehensive either. So, even within that, you still need something that's going to translate between the different open standards. And then, of course, you've got lots of open proprietary ones still going, uh, and especially for your legacy buildings. So the integration challenge is good. The good news is there are solutions for this now. We have the technology to do that, to link all of those together. Uh, and that's what's facilitating being able to pull all this data together, to have a single brain for the whole building, to help it operate in a smarter way. But IoT has brought a whole new set of challenges to us because there's a whole lot of new standards. Uh, and some of these are emerging and not so widely deployed. Others are still uh, are well, perhaps well known to you. You probably recognize them. And there are lots of things going on. And, and I can't even begin to say in this time uh, all of that. But the, these, this is what we have to deal with in, in terms of understanding how to pull things together. And in terms of the big data and the analytics, there's a whole load more stuff going on, and these are some of the players in the industry. So we're not just talking about buildings, of course, either, because there's also the need to link between cars and, and public transport and uh, the buildings and the outdoor spaces as well. Uh, and in, if you're on a campus, if you're looking after a campus of buildings, you've got to worry about the outside public spaces as well as the internal building spaces. But the IoT... And the technologies that are emerging for that are, can encompass all of that. Now, one of the earlier speakers, I think it was Oliver, the first talk, was you put it on a very similar slide to this one, which was, uh, was I borrowed it from James Lang LaSalle, who have a huge property management company globally. Um, he was using slightly different figures, but in, in, in the US, they, they reckon as a rule of thumb that it, your energy bill is costing you about $3 a square foot because they're still working in imperial measure. Uh, rent is costing you about $30 a square foot, and your employee costs are about $300 a square foot. But it's the same kind of ratio as Oliver was talking about, which is uh, the, the, the 1, 10, 100. So anything you can do to impact on productivity and well-being 
is far more significant than what you can do to what you do to impact on energy. Now, the industry I've lived in has been very focused on how to um, minimise energy costs and optimise that, and then to some extent operational costs to uh, reduce the the maintenance uh, aspect of things. But they haven't really been focused on employee and the productivity arguments. But that's something that in Distech has changed significantly over the last few years because we've realise that this is where things are going and so we've we've adjusted uh, what our system is capable of to uh, to accommodate that so we can talk about the productivity arguments so that's what I'd like to because the talk is about bringing value of IOT in buildings I'd like just having told you what I think IOT is about um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the value propositions around that so Employee well-being, why are we bothered about that? Well, it's probably self-evident to you, but you know, it's about productivity, attracting the right employees, and retaining the ones, uh, retaining the ones you have them to stop staff turnover. And of course, why do you want to do that? Well, you want to do that because that improves profitability if you're a pro profit organization. I know some of you are public sector, but uh, obviously private business driven by that. And obviously that results in business or organizational success. And the well-being standard already got mentioned by Oliver, so I'm afraid I'm duplicating there, but I think this is a really important dimension to where, where the thinking about how we manage buildings is going. It's not just functionally creating a space that happens to be the right temperature. It's creating an environment that people want to work in, they want to come back to, and is flexible and serves the need of the organisation. And because of that, we're seeing a, a growth of the desire for building applications. And we're involved in a number of projects, uh, big tower. And it's interesting that we're looking out over here because it, it, we're, we're stronger in France, where perhaps 50% of what we'd be looking at would be have our controls in them. Uh, and we're finding the building owners and operators of these uh, buildings are wanting to develop an app per building for their employees. So they want something that will bring together all the aspects of the employee working there so that they can know where the local restaurants are, they can book tables, they can book taxis, they can know what the tube, what problems there are on the tubes, they can book meeting rooms through the app, they can do everything they do. And they also want to be able to control their local environment, which is the bit that we integrate to. But the list of what they can do on the app is quite long. Uh, and you know, you, again, you can read what's on the list here, but there's all sorts of aspects. I mean, for example, you know, having an IP camera looking at the queue in the canteen to see whether there's a, how, how many people are there, and or, or perhaps incentivizing people to spread their lunchtime to go when there isn't so busy, so you don't have such a problem with the, with the catering or being everyone crowding in at one o'clock. So there's all sorts of things that you can do uh, once you link things together. I mean, perhaps you know you've mapped what the occupancy uh, of the building is and where who's been using that floor that day and how much, and then optimise the cleaning regime. So instead of the cleaners having to go around all the areas every day, they just go to the places that have been used most intensely that day, and so you're that, that you you do a dynamic cleaning regime, as it were. Those are just a couple of examples. Now, this has all come about because of smartphones, and none of this existed before. And the App Store itself, the whole concept of an App Store, didn't exist before the iPhone. Uh, so, you know, these technology changes are coming at us quite fast. I think it's only 10 years now since the iPhone was actually developed. Can we believe that? I don't know. I'm on my, about my fifth iPhone, and, and probably you're, you're either Android or, or uh, iPhone. Any BlackBerry users still here? Maybe not. Uh, but, you know, they've gone away, and now it's all iPhones or Android. So. It's all happened rather fast. So here's some real cases of real buildings that, that we're involved with uh, and different styles of apps because each building owner has their own agenda and they want to do it a bit differently. But when you talk about a smart building, and here's an example of an airport, I mean, gosh, the systems that you have to deal with, there's a huge number. I'm sorry if that hasn't come out. Oh, yes, it's okay. It does come out. There's lots and lots of different systems that we have to, to think about and lots of different dimensions to the... Uh, the problem. And of course that means that we have to collaborate, in technology wise I mean, uh, and in other ways of course as well, but in collaboration nobody can go it alone anymore. This is too big for any one company. Uh, you have to form alliances and, and get together with others to deliver these kind of solutions. So that's generating new ways of working in business because of the rate of uh, technology take up and also these different dimensions that so you've got the, the mobile and the um, mobility applications, you've got apps, <coughs> 
Uh, you've got cybersecurity issues that you have to worry about, the data protection and so on. And all of that means that we have to work together more uh, as businesses in order to make this happen. And of course, that is also generating a need for new skills. Uh, because a combination of both the, the knowledge of the building and the practicality, the mechanics of it all, plus the, the, the technical computery skills uh, of, of IT. So that's creating a new challenge for the industry, how to, to, to create those skills. So in conclusion, and this is a very brief walkthrough of, of the value propositions, uh, you know, everything's going to get connected. Uh, and that, the reason that is useful to do is because you can then do new things with your building that you couldn't do before and give your users of the building new benefits that they weren't able to access before. Uh, in order to, for that to happen, we're going to have to have open standards. Uh, and they're, they're, we're on a journey there because there, there is this plethora of open standards even, but still moving away from proprietary ones. But the good news is that there is integration technology available uh, from us and from others that can bring that together. Uh, and that a lot of this data that we're generating from our buildings is going to end up stored in the cloud and will be accessed through services that you can pay for on a month-by-month -month basis without it being a CapEx uh, issue. And then what we're trying to do is predict problems ahead of time by analyzing the data rather than just reacting to things. Uh, and then optimizing the building, in not just in terms of energy, but in the way you use the space and, and the way employees are interacting with the building. And that that's also going to uh, need the, a lot of the existing systems that are installed be augmented with additional sensors, additional data points, uh, and more edge processing of, of what's going on in the building. So it's about unifying what's going on, and, and then also changing the user experience. Uh, the, the solutions need to come together. Uh, the technology we use is called Niagara Framework, uh, and that pulls together the different standards and makes them all work together. Uh, your building really needs to have a BMS that is all IP-based, because the, all of this is only really possible when you get onto an IP level. Um, and th that will benefit all the different stakeholders in the process, from the building owner, the user, the occupant, and, and the person maintaining and installing the systems. And uh, just to close, uh, I just want to show you a video uh, which uh, um, illustrates what, some of what I've been talking about. Uh, so apologies in advance that this is a Distec video, not just a generic one, but it's of our building uh, in Lyon, uh, which uh, I'll show you.
Okay, so I deliberately uh, kept it to 25 minutes, so we have five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, a quick question for me before we open it out to the audience. Um, one of the things that we, I've read about, about, particularly about IoT, is the, the risks involved in terms of um, people hacking systems, particularly FM-related systems, which might have been put in without perhaps the IT department being aware, because we all know that liaising with the IT department can be bit of a torturous experience. What, what that, that is a great first question because actually I think this is one of the big, biggest arguments for upgrading your systems mm -hmm. because the older systems live, were, were designed and developed in the age before cybersecurity really became an issue. Yeah. You know, everyone's Windows computers were getting hacked because mm. all the hackers knew about Windows and they didn't really know about building systems. But post Stuxnet, if everyone remembers that uh, uh, attack on Iran with, with where they got, they got into Siemens PLCs, mm. The hackers have become aware of the potential to disrupt and annoy, if, if, or at least annoy and probably seriously disrupt, uh, what's going on in, in industrial processes or buildings. Mm -hmm. So we have all in building controls have to worry about that now. And I think it's really important that every, all the systems are kept fully up to date. Uh, and a lot of the older systems, particularly if they were connected to IP, would not be uh, necessarily properly protected. The latest technology that we work with is employing the latest state-of-the-art cybersecurity principles with encryption and authentication and so on. There's various dimensions to that. Mm -hmm. It can still be let down by poor management, uh, you know, passwords being stolen and hacked and all the rest of it, but the, there are th because there are, you, the technology is never enough on its own. You have to have the right business processes around it. But given that you, the technology does now exist to do it properly, mm -hmm. and the technology we work is the same stuff that is used by military and uh, the US embassies and others who are really paranoid about mm -hmm. these sort of things. So, so I think I'm confident that what we what we sell at least is is as good as it gets on cybersecurity. So the idea, perhaps, being that as people become more sophisticated, um, then they will start to you know bring in the latest latest um, updates and things like that. So it's sort of a nice virtuous circle. Well, I think if you're, yes, I mean, if you uh, update, it's one of the arguments you can use if you want to update your system. Uh, it, you, the other option is to say, oh, I've got this terribly old fashioned system that's proprietary and it's sat over there as an island, I'm just going to leave it where it is because no one's ever going to hack that. Yeah. But frankly, that's not really very f forward looking. No. If you are going to bring it forward and give the latest features, I've been, talked to several people here today already who say, well, my building, my system's about 10 years old. It was all right when we put it in, but now, really, I'm wanting more from it. I want to be able to interact with it through my mobile phone. It can't do that. It's a Windows PC on a desk somewhere. And, and I need to be able to get it. My service engineers need to be able to get it wherever they are. They get called up at night. I want to be able to fix things straight away, uh, that sort of thing. So if you're going to do that, you are going to have to connect it to the internet one way or another. And therefore, you're going to have to have IP connect, uh, connection. And therefore, you're going to have to think about cybersecurity. But as long as you go to a good vendor who worries about these things and you ask the right questions and make sure you get the right answers, then you should be OK. okay cool. yeah. Right. Uh, any questions from the audience for Chris? Okay, so right. thank you very that much. Was, that was fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. okay, thank you.